John Oliver is here. Eight years ago, he arrived in New York City for the very first time to audition for The Daily Show. 24 hours after getting the job, he was on stage with John Stewart as the program's senior British correspondent. A three-month stint filling in for Stewart last summer and garnered positive reviews and a flurry of offers for Oliver to strike out on his own. And now he has. Last week tonight debuted on April in April on HBO. And here is what it looks like. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we did a piece about net neutrality. Uh, and there was a moment in it where we pointed out that Tom Wheeler, the chair of the FCC, which is tasked with regulating cable companies, was previously a lobbyist for the cable industry. Something of a conflict of interest uh, that we summarised thusly. That is the equivalent of needing a babysitter and hiring a dingo. <laughs> Sure, it's a little offensive to Australia's favourite baby-eating animal, but needs much for the joke. And, look, you're probably wondering why I'm playing it again now. Well, on Friday, the FCC held an open meeting, and this happened. I'm just wondering if you watched the John Oliver segment about net neutrality and what you thought about it. <laughs> oh, sh uh, That is not good. Uh, so... What did he think? I think that it represents the um, high level of interest that exists in the topic in the country, um, and that's good. Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I would like to state for the record that I'm not a dingo. <laughs> Last week tonight airs Sunday nights at 11 p.m. on HBO. I'm pleased to have John Oliver back at this table. Welcome. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. You, you... I know Tom Wheeler, by the way. Yeah. I've known him for 30 years. And what are you saying? He's corruptible? Is that what you're saying? No. All I'm pointing out, Charlie, yeah. is that the former head of a cable lobby lobbying group right. might not be the ideal objective head of the FCC. Oh. It's more a suggestion than maybe those two worlds... <laughs> well, maybe he needed experience. You get experience You're by right. lobbying for the cable companies. <laughs> Therefore, you Sorry, understand them. I know exactly once the you understand them, That's... you can regulate You're them. Right. I'll take you once back. they have paid you to represent them, then you have a capacity to regulate There's them. There's no conflict of interest. <laughs> you think, I know exactly who I want in there, because it'll be someone that doesn't fight me all the time. I can be that person. Yes, but he was so nice and gentle in his response. He was when you accused him of these egregious no, acts. Nice and gentle. I didn't accuse him of egregious acts. I accused him of well, resembling a baby-eating dingo. <laughs> That's, different. That's just a dingo That's doing what a dingo does. Okay, so That's let, my point. Help me understand this. Um, you substituted for John Stewart. Yep. Did that. <laughs> then you came on this show. Yeah, that's true. You know, and had a sterling performance, not unlike your three weeks, uh, three months of sitting in for John. Right after that, yeah. you got a big offer from HBO. I'm just asking. I'm asking. Yeah. Sitting in for John Stewart, appearing on my show, a big new show for you. Yeah. I'm asking. This is just a gateway. What you're saying is, <laughs> you're saying, oh, no, what you're saying is you'd like a piece on the back end. I did. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> just go, just give me a taste. I just took 10. Give me a little taste. Just, 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 just 10, but double figures. <laughs> no, it was weird, because I remember sitting yeah. down with you. It was the final week of hosting yes. over the summer. Yes. I remember you saying... Do you, is, do you think, is your life going to change now? Yeah. And I said no. no. And you looked at me like I was insane. I did. And there was something about your face just going, yo, oh, this kid doesn't know. He doesn't this know. idiot doesn't know. He doesn't get it. Yeah, so it was, he yeah, that wasn't know how good he is, by the way. <laughs> Yes, I, the jury is still very much out on that, Charlie, as you well know. That is a fierce deliberation going on in that jury of whether I'm any good or not. Oh, come on. You're universally acclaimed as a brilliant comedian. <laughs> universally? Wow. You are writing checks that my popularity cannot catch, Charlie. I am an acquired taste okay. at best. So tell me about this experience of creating your own show. Yeah. Here you are. You go over there with this phenomenal background as a highly acclaimed comedian who is substituted for the one and only John Stewart. Yeah, right. And that's high praise. And yeah. to be given the opportunity and then to do it so well. Well, yeah, that was, the, you know, it would, that was kind of the apex of my time at The Daily Show was kind of being in a position where John would trust me, rightly or wrongly, with kind of being the custodian of his show for a few months. Now, and it was an amazing honour. Now, did you think for a moment, if I do this well, like on day one, day two, day three, if I do this well, 
at the end of three months, little John Oliver will have his own show. No, I didn't think that for a single moment, as you could tell from my face during our interview. Yes. When we're one day from the end and you're saying, so what next? We're going, I'm going to go back. Yeah, Everything's yeah. going to go back to yeah. how it was. So, no, there was no point at which... Uh, I thought it was going to lead to anything other than hopefully not being in trouble when John got back. So how do you like it, doing your own show? I love being it. I mean, in it was charge and responsible that, um, for that, lots of comedy. Yeah, that's, that is, you know, it's a different level because I've been under his wing, under John's protective wing. Yes, for, so that, you know... The, and if it went bad, he could go to someone else. Of course, that's right. Or he can just, he would, you know, can take the blows for me. <laughs> yes. So, no, I've had this wonderful position for nearly a decade where I've been, like... Snuggled up under his wing, uh, and, and now you're exposed. There's now no I'm exposed. John to protect you. Now, yes, right. And now I would start, there are times when <laughs> I would love to look up and see that wing above me. Yeah, yeah but he's. Uh, yeah, it's been. Uh, it's been very. Di being a boss has been very different. Setting stuff up myself has been a challenge. I'm not. I don't. There are kind of basic management skills that do not come naturally to me. <laughs> you hire people for that. Well, that's yeah. that's what I've learned. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's your answer to every question, though, isn't it, John? <laughs> oh, you hire people for that. <laughs> yes, <exactly. You're>, oh, <laughs> no, don't, no, don't, don't worry. <laughs> you very much have a Caesar view of career. Oh, that's you should not be dirty. You your shouldn't hands worry about that. that. No. <laughs> no, just don't worry about it. You know. Yeah. Let you. Let yeah, but you, you're, you're there for one thing. I worry about everything. You're there for one thing: to entertain us and and to make us laugh. That's all. Right. I don't see it that way because because <laughs> I'm from I'm from I've been raised in. In you know the Daily Show model, which is yeah. where you know John is involved in everything. Detail. He's yeah. he is it, he he is the DNA of that show. Right. Which is why over the summer it's so weird to remove the DNA from I, a show. I have a theory about this. You want to hear it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say yes yet. I'll yeah, say okay, sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Every great television show, you know, it, it comes because it is it is defined by the presence of someone. Right. Like Johnny Carson defined right. the Tonight Show. Ted Koppel defined Nightline when he created this show and, and other shows, certainly Stewart and Knight, Colbert. I mean, there's a drive, and every one of them is maniacal yeah. about the show. Of course. And, well, he's, and yeah. they give it its driving vision. Well, he's one of the, one of the, one of the big things. David that I, Letterman was the same one. For sure. One of the big things that John said that rattles around my head all the time is saying, you know, if you take your foot off the throat of this show, it will get up and walk away. That's exactly and he right. Is 100% right about that yeah. and that has been transferable to what I'm doing now you have to be on it all the time otherwise yeah. you'll look away look back and what you needed has gone yeah. and you have to walk away every day saying that was good but I got to make it better tomorrow of course of course you can't yeah. be happy that is you know th which is why being you can't a be happy you can't be happy that's why <laughs> being a comedian has been so perfect fit for me because you know you can't be there's happy. no comedian walking away from a gig going I feel fully satisfied by that experience <laughs> you <don't. laughs> you're just saying that it didn't yeah. fill the hole it yeah. didn't fill the hole so what's the hardest part about this program for you well I don't know it's all hard at the moment because we haven't really done enough to be in any kind of rhythm. You know, we've oh, done really? seven shows, yeah. so we're still working out the process and even the show itself. How would you define what you want the show to be? I don't know. We're, uh, on a week-to-week -week basis, it's changing. I think we're, we're gravitating towards attacking things that are difficult. You know, g going after something that it kind of merits a week's worth of struggle. Uh, so, uh, you know, things like we've done things on FIFA or the death penalty right. or, or net neutrality. No, none of those things scream, that sounds funny. So when you look at them, no one's looking at net neutrality and thinking, that is begging for comic treatment. You seem to have, to me, and I've known you a couple of years, yeah. a, a huge curiosity in the news. Yeah. I mean, you come to that with, wow. Can you believe this? Right. And you see the contradictions in it. So you see the place where there's, uh, I can get in here and make it right, but it's a different the instinct. irony of it. Right, Ex that's exactly it. That is, that's it in a nutshell, because you're looking for comedic ironies, comedic juxtapositions. And so in something like what we did with uh, net neutrality, there's, there's an inherently comedic element yes. of a kind of stupid call to arms because you're dealing with something which is incredibly important and incredibly boring <laughs> and affects <laughs> some of the most driven people in the world, online commenters. Yes. So you, you kind of, there, there is an inherent juxtaposition between uh, the fact that no one cares about this and yet the people who should care the most about it are some of the most poisonous. <laughs> 
<laughs> active uh, online individuals. Does it make any difference you're on HBO and therefore you can say whatever you want to well, say? Well, it's been amazing. Yeah, it's made <laughs> You don't have to bleep it. You don't have to bleep it. It's not even to bleep it, sure. You don't have to, it, and look, uh, it's a curse word is, uh, you know, a, a violin upon which you can play any tune. <laughs> yes. uh, but also just in terms of content, you know, to do, to do, be able to do a, a long piece about the death penalty or about FIFA yeah. is amazing because they don't, there's no restrictions. They'll they just let you do anything. Like FIFA just begs to be satire, yeah. doesn't it? And to be made. Yeah, because it's <laughs> like, it's basically ancient Rome in a current <laughs> sports organization. That's, that's, see, and that's what you got to find. Yeah, and, and you're talking Rome about, as and a comparison. Right, and you're looking at Caligula. <laughs> yes, you are. Look, we're not talking about functional Rome. We're talking about the guy <laughs> appointing Caligula, horses yes. senators. <laughs> that's what you're dealing with with FIFA. Yes. So yeah, the whole thing is a mess. Yeah. It's a, like a circus. All right, take a look at this clip. I want you to see this clip. Here it is. I would like to talk to you about the sausage principle, uh, the theory that says if you love something, never find out how it was made. Well, <laughs> tonight, I would like to show you my sausage. Wait, 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 wait. This is my sausage. The 2014 FIFA World Cup. Oh, my God! <laughs> OK, the World Cup starts this week, and I am both excited and extremely conflicted about it. Now, I know, in America, soccer is something you pick your ten-year-old daughter up from, but, <laughs> but for me and everyone else on Earth, it's a little more important. Soccer had become Brazil's religion. In Colombia, soccer was a religion. Football is a religion here. Soccer or football, like we say, <laughs> it's a religion. Yeah, and they're not exaggerating. When David Beckham got a tattoo of Jesus, the response of most soccer fans was, oh, that, that's huge for Jesus. That's, that's a big deal for him. He, here's, here's my conflict. The World Cup is one of my favorite things, but it's organized by these guys, FIFA. You either know it as the Fédération Internationale de Football Association, or that soccer video game you have. But for American viewers who may never have encountered them, FIFA is a comically grotesque organization. In fact, telling someone about the inner workings of FIFA for the first time is a bit like showing someone two girls one cup. You, you do it mainly so you can watch the horrified expression on people's faces. I think that was lovely, but sausage is such a cheap shot. Sure. Look at my sausage. Yeah, look at my sausage. <laughs> but you, you're chumming the water for, the, for what's coming, Charlie. <laughs> You're just shaking it up. That's right, so they'll exactly. Know you you get there. Exactly, there's a little red yeah. meat to little, <laughs> just to get everyone's attention. And David Beckham makes Jesus look good. He does. Yeah. You know, David Beckham is, you know, in, in many ways, uh, a religious figure. But I met him once, and I felt like I'd met God in a way. Oh, did you really? Yeah, and I probably dealt with it even worse than if I met the living Christ. I've never had the pleasure. Oh, oh. he yeah. is perfect. He's is like he really? A, yeah, he's, I mean, the, he's, uh, his Achilles heel. He looks heel, perfect. He is marble. Is he, he, is, really? he looks like he's a Greek like statue. Like a statue of a god. Perfect. A god. The problem is he has a voice that looks like he's inhaled helium. <laughs> That's the one thing. <laughs> oh, you no. can't have him speak. Are you serious? Yeah, I, I swear to you. Like you'll say, David, great to meet you. <laughs> oh, lovely to meet you. <laughs> Love, lovely to meet you, Charlie. No. Oh, no, oh, no, no. And you just go, oh, I'll be so David, disappointed. Shh, David, close your mouth and just look askance for me. <laughs> just give him a profile. Like this? No, not like that, David. <laughs> Without your mouth moving. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm telling you. It's, it's awful. Other than comedy. Yes. What do you want your show to be? Uh, basically nothing. Other than, it's a comedy show. <laughs> okay. So it has to be that. Okay. If, it, well, if it's we're, not we're that. We're accepting that. Yeah. We want to go one step beyond comedy. It would, it what be, else? To be, if, if it's interesting, that is, that's fun as well. If it's, do, if it's comedy about some interesting things. How about an insight into something and a way of looking at it that you hadn't thought about? Sure. Why you know, not? Like yeah. The idea of hiring the guy who, who, who right. formerly represented the cable company. Right. You know. Right. Because exactly, because there are, and like you were saying, there are inherent comic juxtapositions throughout that story. Yeah. So you want to highlight those with comedy, especially with a story like that, which is boring. That is the most important story at the moment, which is too boring to care about. Mm. What's the biggest story for you 
I mean, think about the week that we're in. We you know, did, we got the World Cup, you've got the we, war we in Iraq. The, we got, did a big, sure. our first show, we did the Indian election. The, oh, basically, yes, the most yes. of the show was just, <laughs> the, it's the mo there was nothing yeah. not interesting about the Indian election to me. The biggest, there was nothing, nothing not interesting. Because it's the largest democracy in the world and oh, they're it's electing. It's the biggest expression of democracy in the history of Earth. <laughs> this, this, if that's, if not, that's not interesting, not story, nothing, 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 is. nothing is ever interesting. <laughs> if, you and if you can't find something interesting in the largest democracy in the history of the world. Yeah, then you have have your eyes closed <laughs> and you're, you're in the wrong shot. place yeah it, it's a, <laughs> that, that election was astonishing yeah. and 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 you know in a in a, 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 a situ in a country that is you know riddled with class yes. uh, you have Narendra Modi a deeply controversial figure yes. uh, who used to sell tea at a railway station it's yeah. there's nothing that was not amazing about that election to me and it was covered so spectacularly over there. That's when you realize that our cable news has become an airborne disease <laughs> and has made it to India. Yes. <laughs> it's true. Now, you had General Alexander on your show, too. Yeah. I mean, he's the guy who ran NSA. The NSA. He ran the NSA during its yeah. most, uh, let's say, fervent period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When they were most active around the world. When they were certainly most, that's right. When they were defending us most rigorously, yes. he would say. Yeah. <laughs> and you could say, by the way, you probably don't know that I'm, and they could say, oh, we know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You probably don't know that I'm a Brit. They say, oh, no, we know. It was, it <laughs> you didn't know that my mother's sister there was, I, <laughs> worked. I, before, I, I emailed the questions to our producer, and there was a moment... When, when I was filling in the subject line, I'd, I'd, I'd written General Alexander questions, and there was a moment I caught myself going, "Is this? Should I do that? <laughs> should I call this something else? Like you know, like menu for tomorrow?" Yes. It's weird how it plays with your mind. Yeah. Interviewing skills. Uh, I mean, is that one of the things that you've had to develop? Uh, first with John, and then with this show. Yeah, in two speeds, I think, because I think there's two, two different. Kind of, like I, I interviewed. Um, just on this week's show, we had Stephen Hawking as a guest. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Tell me all about it, because I've done the same thing. Yeah. So I can't wait to compare notes. Yeah, so he's... Well, I really wanted to speak to him for, like, a multitude of reasons. One, because, I've, you know, he's a fascinating guy. He's very funny. Right. He has a great sense of humour. And he is, obviously wrongly, defined by his disability. Right. In, and it is the least interesting part of him as a man. Yes. You just... You, I hate the... I hate the idea that most people, when they think of him, will think, oh, that guy in the chair with the, with the big electronic the voice. He... Yeah, and that's not right. There is a personality in there. There's, there's not much left but of his body. But here's the difficulty, and, and when you go see him, and I did this four or five years ago, went out to Cambridge, you have to submit the questions well, because he needs time. It's got, right, and it's actually got even worse yeah, over the oh, last really. few years because uh, he's the, he is really slowed down. His, his physical limitations are... Uh, worse than ever. So how did you meet the challenge of well, interviewing Stephen Hawking? We emailed back and forth and um, uh, emailed like some, some of the bigger questions right. that would take a more involved right. response and then uh, I'd said in, in asking him to do the interview, I would like this to be funny, I know that you know, you've got a good sense of humour, so then I might ask you this on the back of it, that's a dumb question, then you can get me. Right. And so then he would come up with a slam. So, and that that was really fun to watch because he's not, he's uh, But you know you haven't been. He's engaged in the game if he'll do yeah, that. Yeah, and he's, like, he's, the, the difficult thing in approaching that in a comedic context, that interview, is that uh, his face cannot, is not very expressive anymore. There's not much, he really only has one working muscle there now. Yeah. So I was concerned about about showing that he was involved in and having fun in the game. And there was one moment when I knew he was about to get me where I swear you could see his face light up because he knew he had a zinger ready and was going to mm. drop it on me. And it was awesome. It was mm. just awesome. Uh, I and was, you could see it, though. You, you could see he, it. You could see because you could he see, was ready to... Yeah, he was ready. He knew exactly yeah, the where... The button is there. Right, except not even... That's the amazing thing because the, long gone are the days where he's pushing I know, anything. I know, I know. So but it's I just somebody, you know. But yeah, uh, but he j can just blink. You know, right, so that's right. where he's triggering it with, with a blink and he knew and he he got me and he yeah. knew he got me and his face you know, lit up and it was, was awesome. Why was he so interesting for you? Because I think it's... Again, it's, I'm not... I, I don't know, like most people, I don't know you didn't study what his physics. research, uh, for sure. To the point that I knew, even at one point, I was in his office and I was, uh, I was quite close to the blackboard yeah. and uh, my, my uh, shoulder <laughs> brushed it and they did run over going, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you just rubbed when off I, the theory of the world. Exactly, and yeah. you see what it looks like, scribble. Look, I'll put it back. 
Um, but I wanted to get at the fact that there yeah. is a human being in there whose mind is incredibly agile, who has a personality that's not just about his work, mm. and it's hard to get at because there's not much physically left. But I, I wanted, I, I wanted to try and show the the man inside this you know incredibly difficult situation mm. and because he's funny and I wanted him to be yeah. funny and he was I yeah. think one of the great things about having a show like you do like I do yeah. it is you can get up in the morning and say who do I want to meet and right. how do I want to find it now do you have anybody I mean and you I mean one of the reasons I like you so much is that, is that there's a curiosity about the world around you I mean, beyond can I find humor in this right. it is you know, this is sort of the world I live in, and I'm interested in the world I live in. And then, do you then have to take it to the next step and say, but can I make it funny? Can right. I find the irony in it? Can That's I it. find... Yes, exactly. Because, right, because there's natural, there's places where you go naturally going, this person is incredibly fascinating, but to what extent can you apply humour to that in a way to make it no, uh, to make it interesting in a different way, because you don't want, you know, you don't want to be too abrasive. Sometimes there are places where irony is difficult. Even, yeah. even talking to Stephen Hawking, you're worried that that can come across as bullying unless yeah. you control it or patronising or for whatever. sure. And you don't want it. He is like, people infantilise him all the time, yeah. and that's he's smarter than almost everyone. So there's no need to do that. You want to show that he can stick up for mm -hmm. himself. And yeah, in other interviews, there are there's definitely times where you need to work out where irony is useful and where it can be a problem. Mm. It was hard. I did a piece in, about UNESCO in Gabon, yes. uh, and it was, uh, this was for The Daily Show, and it's, uh, it w I was worried about how irony would work in a classroom that was about to get shut down uh, full of uh, kids in West Africa. Mm. You, you, worry, you worry about whether irony in that room will work. You know that it will afterwards in the edit yeah, for the function of right. the piece. As it happened, yeah. it was fine. But that was that would be an example of a time where you worry. Oh, I'm not sure. We need to be careful here. Now, suppose you had a brilliant idea and and you didn't want to put it on your show for whatever reason. Yeah. Would you pick up the phone and call John and say, "Man, do I have an idea? I'm coming back over to do something or do contracts and how little I understand about the way the world works." I don't Prevent know. Prevent that. I don't know. Probably no. Probably we could do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's been amazing. Oh, I you speak could have to him, him on your show at yeah. some point oh, if you sure. wanted to. I speak to him I, I, it, at least on email, probably you know once a week, and just to uh, you know ask him about. But stuff you said that you live with the idea. I don't want to disappoint John. Yeah, still that he's still my, high, right, he's still my high watermark. So I always I don't want to let him down. I didn't want to let him down when I was you know sitting in his job for him, and I, but I still don't want to let him down now. He's still yeah. the the yeah the benchmark for me. Why did you become a comedian? Uh, because I had no place else to go, Charlie. <laughs> is that right? Pretty much. No, it's not. It's pretty. When close did you to know the truth. this is what? It was when I realised. I think there was. A, you, know, I, you know, I wanted like a, as a kid, I wanted to be a footballer. I wanted to be like David sure. Beckham right. in every way. In every way. Yeah. Yes. Uh, none of exactly. that worked out. That's right. My voice is too low. We know that now. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, then uh, <laughs> then I loved comedy. Yes. And uh, I started doing it at college, and I loved doing it so much that I realised I was going to have to give it a go. And then it, I kind of started, you know, struggled, and I was a, a few years in. And uh, this is post college. This is post college. I was a few years into doing it barely professionally, sustaining myself, but not a dignified life. <laughs> So it still counts. <laughs> okay, so what's an example of sustaining myself but not a dignified life? That you can't afford orange juice with pulp in it. <laughs> Just have that to, used to be a tr that's like, still my you, you, orange juice in a can. No, oh yeah, no, like squash, <laughs> English, like concentrate with water on top. <laughs> oh, yes, still I my see. my, oh, my, my barometer of success low. is still whether that you can low. have. Yeah, it's not that low. That's not that low, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you've been too successful for too long. No, Charlie. No, no, Are you no, li I mean, living like I an animal? You were saying that. No. Um, no. Yeah, no, there was. Th and so I, I'd done that for years. And I remember my dad saying to me, oh, I really admire that you never, you never gave up. And it never even occurred to me, me to give up. Me I didn't even occur that was an option. And it really, it was me. chilling to me. Because I remember going upstairs and thinking, hold on, sh should I have given up? Yes. And then I realised, 
it's too late now. Yes. I have no transferable skills. <laughs> right. If this doesn't work, <laughs> it's, it's a disaster. It's so it was of his conversation of going, I really admire that you've stuck with this. And it, it, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that no one pointed yeah. that out earlier. The, the other side of that is that people, they, they stick it out and they never think about not doing anything else. And they believe that somehow, some way, yeah. you know, but they can't quite figure out what way, but they believe it. And then once they've done it and they look back and they say, Oh my God, I would never do that again, though. I would never do that again. Yeah. If I'd known it was that hard, I wouldn't have done it. But well, you, when you're doing it, you don't think about that. Right, and there's, right, there is, and especially with stand up, John and I have talked about this a bunch, that it's almost self selecting, because it's so miserable when you're starting off as a stand up. Yeah. You're being routinely humiliated. Right. You're going to places you are not required, <laughs> uh, certainly not enjoyed, and, and not welcome. It destroys personal relationships. <laughs> yeah. You can't afford orange juice with pulp in it. Yeah. There's no upside other than the fact that you have to do it. And so if there's any reason to quit you will find it so it kind of self-selects people yeah. that are just so drawn to ah. it that they will go through whatever so to people the... who are not going to make it will find a way not to make it yeah i think so we'll, we'll because find a way to accept not making it yeah and it, you just never and because you it. still want to go back there's an amazing uh episode of louis from the first season oh, God, I love and and there was this thing i found really moving there's this one episode where uh, he gets the night off uh, and he gets a babysitter and he tries to go out with some friends and it just doesn't it doesn't work it doesn't work uh, at all, and he's not happy, and he doesn't feel like he fits in. And so um, he walks home, and he walks past a terrible comedy, like basement dive comedy club, and he says to the guy at the front, who's in? They went, oh, it's like six tourists, you know, a couple of Lithuanians. And he says, can I get up? And he goes on stage, and for the first time in the episode, he looks happy in this mess. He's bombing. Yeah. He's not doing well, but he's really enjoying himself. And then he goes home, and he gets his daughters up, and he takes them out for, like, a, like <laughs> yeah. an early breakfast and a diner. And that, to me, that hits so home so hard, because those are norm the, I'm normally the most comfortable in some of the most disgusting places. I remember my... <laughs> My wife's parents coming to see me once in a state, like at this grimy stand up club. Yeah. And they were kind of saying, they were like, mentioning. This is a very American family, too. Yeah, yeah. And they were just, it was just I think they were, they, they were just thinking, what, why do you, this doesn't seem nice, it doesn't smell nice. <laughs> Like the, the carpet sticking to your feet. Why and go, are you yeah, doing this? Because this is where I'm happiest. <laughs> it's true. And then you could feel that sense of, and you're going to bring our daughter into this world? It's <laughs> not what we intended for her at all. <laughs> oh, we didn't want her no even parents. hanging out here. That's right. This just seems <laughs> awful. I feel unclean. <laughs> like the grease of onion rings in the yeah. air. And, and when did you know you had sort of had some degree of success so that it had all paid off? I notice I I'm not saying you had made it. I'm yeah. just saying you had a degree of success. No, that's a, good, that's a good way of putting it. And I think there might be a single moment, <laughs> actually, because I think there was this guy, there's this guy, Armando Inucci, who I oh, really, yes, yes, really yes. love him. Right. And he uh, employed me to uh, write on this uh, show during an, uh, a by-election in England. And I made him laugh. And he was uh, quite a defining figure during my childhood, all the comedy right. that he'd right. made. And I remember thinking... After he, and it was a proper laugh, not like a kind of friendly... He, like, he really laughed hard. And I remember thinking, I think I'm good now. I think this feels like the house is money from now on. Because yeah. if I... That, there was a legitimacy in thinking, oh, so I wasn't crazy to want to do this. He found something I said funny. So at this point on, I can't really complain about anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that, that was probably the point where I thought, I'm, I'm OK now. And then how did you get hired by The Daily Show? They were looking for someone because they were about to lose... <laughs> a senior British correspondent. Yeah, well, that's right. Well, they were looking... They were about to lose a couple of correspondents yeah. uh, to other jobs. Uh, Ed Helms was going to the office and right. Rob Caudry was leaving for a sitcom. Right. And uh, so they needed someone and they just threw the net a little bit wider. And I think Ricky Gervais had... Rec I didn't know him, uh, but I think he... Had he said recommended you even though you did not know him? Yeah, I think he knew the kind of things that I was writing in England. And so I think he'd said to John, you should take a look at this guy. And then it happened very fast. Yeah. I mean, there is within the the club of comedians a sense of who's doing what well and and yeah. who's beginning to hit it and who yeah. has developed yeah. a kind of yeah one of the most career. exciting things is seeing comedians you've not seen before doing something great yeah. like it's you know calling around to go actually there's this guy he's started i'm not sure if he's i think he has just started on the daily show but i remember seeing him very early michael che oh yes he's yeah. really good yeah he's a really good stand-up i remember yeah. seeing him a few years ago doing stand-up and it was that feeling of going oh wow you are going to be great. Yeah, you can yeah. see it. Yeah. yeah. Much success to you. Thanks, Thanks Charlie. Charlie. It's great to have you on this program. It's always good to I see you. I hope you will come back. Whenever. <laughs> thank you. Thank John you. John Oliver, thank you for joining us.
See you next time.